Sorry. Okay. And there we go. Okay, perfect. So once again, welcome everyone to today's talk. Uh, today's talk, oh, sorry. Today's talk will be done by Professor Silvio Fontevich on why science doesn't speak with one voice. Um, before we begin though, I do wanna make a couple of announcements. So our next Risk Institute online talk shall be done by Dr. Vincent Keenan. We're still establishing a date. Uh, we're, we're hoping for early October to sort of mid-October. We also have a conference coming up known as the Mining and Energy Safety for Remote Sensing Conference. Uh, we're aiming to start that around November-ish. We're still finalizing the list of speakers. It will be a hybrid event. So it will be a mixture of in-person speakers as well as some online speakers. If you wish to join, feel free to attend in person. However, if you're unable to attend in person, we will also be hosting a live stream of each talk. So you can review it like either during the talk or after the talk. Okay, so thank you for that. And back to our main talk. So today we have Professor Silvio Fundovich. He's an esteemed mathematician, logician, and philosopher of science who has worked across a variety of academic and regulatory bodies, including the ECJRC, the University of Leeds, and more recently at the SBT at the University of Bergen as a professor and now continuing as a guest researcher. Uh, he is highly known for the new pass system for characterizing uncertainty, as well as his co-development of the post-normal science approach to research and its applications to high stakes, time-dependent decision-making. Uh, Professor Funkovich's work has been greatly influential in policy making, often allowing science and greater public participation in the decision making processes um, when applying research to broad social and economic issues. This is, includes anything from environmental sustainability to emerging technologies and more recently the COVID 19 pandemic. Uh, the, uh, sorry. The post-normal science approach has often been described as a democratization of expertise, pushing for greater public participation in science and policy. And I believe the original paper outlining the post-normal science approach actually is still the highest cited paper on the Futures Journal. Uh, am I correct on that, Professor Funkovich? Funtovich? Uh, yes, it's the most cited paper uh, in the on future studies and not only future a uh, magazine but you know in the whole <laughs> area of uh, a future anticipation this is a most cited paper yes oh wow that is actually extremely impressive well, congratulations and um may i pass the talk on to you to yes uh, 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 okay uh let me try and so uh, yes and uh, here i hope i hope everybody can see well my screen and well first thank you uh, the institute for the invitation and obrigado pedro for your presentation or your introduction uh, Perhaps it's my, my talk is not the usual talk you do uh, at your institute in the sense that probably it's more technical uh, in many ways. But I thought that uh, when I proposed the, 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 the title and I sent an abstract, which is reproduced in your website, uh, it, well, there was a lot of interest about that. Uh, so uh, here it is. Um, uh, I'm using this title. I mean, uh, quite often these days. I changed a bit, a bit the uh, uh, the content has to fit the the audience and the the place. But I think more or less the message I try to convey is always the same. And I hope we can have a conversation when I finished, as I, I, I'm not going to use the whole, I hope, the whole uh, 40, 45 minutes. So 
because it's important to have a conversation and I know people might be interested in asking questions. So uh, thank you in advance. Okay, uh, I the uh, title of, of the uh, talk is, uh, I borrow it from uh, an article it, in a Italian, uh, quite well-known uh, national daily, Corriere della Sera, because as you see the date, it was uh, uh, last year, I think it was uh, 21. And, and there, uh, an immunologist, the scientist who is a member, was a member of the scientific committee advising the government, Italian government on, on what to do in relation to COVID, uh, it said that uh, science has to apologize to the Italian people because it was unable to speak with one voice. Now, uh, I, I'm using COVID because it's something that we experienced and, you know, it's still around and we're still arguing and discussing and talking about it. So it's a good way to introduce the subject, uh, my subject of today. So here, as I say, it's an, an opinion from a scientist, an immunologist, who is also a science advisor. On the other hand, uh, 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 and this person uh, probably you know, those are based in the UK, I mean, is uh, David Spiegelhalter, who's also a member of the uh, scientific committee or the committee advising the, this time the UK government on what to do about the COVID. And, and, and Spiegelhalter has a completely different take on the issue. I mean, he says, uh, he argues that he doesn't like the phrase following the science, which, you know, it was quite widely used almost everywhere. And he says, well, because science doesn't tell you what to do. And he continues saying, how can this be true, follow the science, when the science, science produces dramatically different opinions about uh, what should be done? He, the last the piece, and, and you have the, the reference, so you can go and check the the interview says, well, that the phrase is awful, terrible, because it gives you the wrong impression. It says that it seems to that if you know the science, then you know what to do. Okay, so uh, I, I choose these because they are quite different from two people doing science advice in an emergency, any crisis as it was in COVID. Now, uh, and the questions I want to explore is, and make you reflect about it, is uh, can science speak with one voice? And the second, should science speak with one voice? And the third is, does knowing rele relevant science mean that you know what to do? Now, uh, uh, you see, these are, I believe, important questions. And uh, they are, they were not framed like this by chance, but a part of a long tradition. So uh, people who argue that we should follow the science or governments or whatever authority should follow the science. Well, these are bright, prepared, skilled, knowledgeable people. So why then they are so convinced that uh, you should follow the science? Well, uh, 
this is, um, I'll try to explain that in simple terms. And I borrowed this <laughs> a slide from a colleague at Bergen and it originally was published in a book by Jerry Ravitz in 1971. And what we see is that there is a long tradition in our culture that argues that when you are confronting a practical political problem, political issue, like it was kind of COVID, but not only, then what you should do is to translate it, express it as a scientific technical problem. And once you solve the technical scientific problem, uh, then you have solved also the political and practical problem. Now, uh, sorry about the uh, dogs outside. Uh, it's a, a risk about of living in the countryside. Uh, now, uh, this was actually uh, this was actually quite credible uh, when problems, uh, societal problems were understood as simple or even uh, complicated. And it's the same for the technical problem that, you know, resulted from uh, that interpretation. The technical problems were always, con were conceived also as a uh, simple or complicated. Uh, but uh, what happened when these issues, problems are uh, no longer simple or complicated, but they are complex. And by complex in this uh, context, I mean they are essentially ambiguous, meaning that there is... That there can you hear me? Is there a problem? No. Uh, what it means is that you have a plurality of perspectives that cannot be reduced to a single perspective. Now, this is important and it comes with us uh, in our tradition, as I say, administrative and governmental tradition since the beginning of uh, modernity. And it was quite useful and in many ways successful. Uh, it enabled the development of uh, science and technology and also I would say the uh, development of our uh, governance institutions. Now, what happens when you are no longer in a situation of simplicity or complication. What happens is that uh, the problems we witness uh, during COVID are become uh, public and are no longer hidden. Now, uh, in that sense, uh, people were surprised and not only not only politicians or public in general uh, were surprised uh, about this uh, multiplicity of voices about not only the disease about or even the virus um, or even about what to do and how to do it we were not surprised, actually. Uh, we were not surprised, and this is, I want to show you why we were not surprised. And we were, uh, because uh, during the 80s, uh, we were working in a problem uh, with some colleagues, and you can see that, and, and it was about the the wind scale, Sellafield, uh, 
leukemia cluster on babies. Perhaps some of you will remember it. And at that time, what we saw and what we found is that, uh, well, uh, as in the case of COVID uh, today, there was strong diversions and controversies, uh, not only uh, among disciplinary traditions, but also inside. And what we saw is that uh, epidemiologists, modelers, and uh, local medical doctor GPs uh, disagree about the nature of the cloud, the, the, of the problem, and also about the existence of a causal link between uh, emissions from a cell field and and the uh, and child the clusters of uh, child leukemia. Uh, now, uh, it's interesting because uh, we are talking the eighties, so it's almost uh, forty years ago. Uh, okay. And we are still surprised and we are still discussing about controversies in this type of science, which are a, a still a, in a situation of a complexity. Now, a, as I say, but at that time, and uh, this is a reference to the book by Sally about the politics uh, where we wrote one chapter about uh, the inquiry and what was called the Black Report on the subject. And the result of that was that the link was not proven. Now, at that time, we were not surprised either. And why we were not surprised? Well, because already uh, in the early 70s, uh, nuclear engineer uh, Arwin Weinberg uh, uh, published an article that was uh, in, that was the article in Minerva, but uh, it was also uh, reproduced and discussed in, in science and other scientific journals where he introduced the term trans science. Now, the idea, uh, and interesting hey, enough, enough uh, yeah. interesting enough, uh, someone has the microphone on, I'm getting uh, So uh, interesting enough, the problem Alwyn Weinberg had at that time was quite similar to the problem of in wind scale. And, but the question was framed in, in, in a more general uh, form. And it was, uh, can we prove scientifically that the re relation between emissions from a nuclear power station working normally, we are not, we are not talking about here about an accident and let's say environmental and health effects. And what Weinberg shows is that we can't to the level of confidence that it will be required. And he calls that type of scientific problem trans-scientific. I, uh, I like to use this, uh, 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 this reference, which comes from a citation index. I think most of you young people, especially, uh, are used to the internet. No, uh, we are talking on 1972, there was already a citation index. And this is from citation index of that time. And it was called, it is a classical citation. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this uh, discussion of the citation, uh, 
there are two other uh, interesting contributions. The first uh, is from Harvey Brooks, uh, who based on his experience on the beginning of a systems analysis and at the Institute of Applied uh, Systems, International System of Applied Systems in, in Luxembourg, in, in, in Vienna, uh, he said, well, not only the type of experimental or field work has the problem of being transscientific, but also those who deal with a complex systems of equations. And he says, we know from the time of Poincaré, that was at the beginning of the 1900, that a, a complex equations, you know, complex systems are not simple or complicated. And I've used this distinction before, but it was originally based on Poincaré's uh, work on the three-body problem. Now, the third element that I want to mention is here is, uh, comes from uh, William Ruckelshaus, who was uh, twice uh, head of the US Environmental Protection Agency. And he gave what I think is the a good uh, definition of what a transscientific problem is. And he says a transscientific problem is one that can be expressed scientifically, but cannot be solved scientifically. And he continues, uh, he wrote a book uh, called uh, Risk, uh, Science and Democracy. He was a very important person. He even was a uh, head of the FBI. And he said, most of the problems I had to deal in my tenure as head of EPA were of a trans-scientific character. Now, I don't have the time because I think I need a, a year to unpack a, what does it mean that the problem can be expressed scientifically or that what does it mean that the problem can be solved scientifically? The fact is that in this area of practical political problems that I said are complex in the sense that they are ambiguous, eh, we are in a realm that is not the one of a modern disciplinary science. And it's interesting that this has been around now for 50 years. And it's still a, quite difficult to grasp for many. Now, a, the second element that we were not surprised again about the level of disagreement and controversy is a, because of a, the beginning during 60s, 70s, of what it was called the popular epidemiology movement. And uh, this is a paper by a, a colleague from Bergen, uh, Ragnar Fjellen, and it was, it was about one of the paradigmatic cases of uh, popular epidemiology and environmental contamination and pollution, and it was the Love Canal. I don't know if you're familiar with it. I invite you to look at it. And substantially, uh, there, there was clearly a strong disagreement between accredited experts and uh, the residents of the place, the citizens who had to construct, produce their own science, their own knowledge base in order to defend themselves and against the 
contamination and the pollution. I invite you to look at Louis Gibbs, uh, who was one of the people, she was a mother of uh, Love Canal, and it's a very interesting story. It was at that time that it was, perhaps today is not a correct uh, the term, but it was called housewife epidemiology, okay? Uh, later it became popular epidemiology, and today after the cases in Flint and, you know, on the water contamination and so on, uh, we, uh, we can call it undone science. So uh, the science that it, or knowledge that it's not done by accredited experts, and it has to be created by a community that suffers the risk, pollution and contamination, and in a situation of conflict. Okay, now, uh, the element I want to mention is a small detour. And because I'm talking about an institute of risk and uncertainty, I, I, I just want to give you a, a short a perspective on my 40 years of or more of working in and on uncertainty and how it has changed. When we started to work and Jerry Rabbits and others, I mean, that was the uh, uh, end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s. Well, uncertainty was not considered a problem in the sense that uh, people thought that you can solve the problem of uncertainty mathematically. So in a sense, and I don't have, the, again, the time to go in, in detail, but substantially people thought that you can reduce uncertainty to risk eh? in the old definition of Frank Knight. And just to show you uh, how uncertainty was hidden, eh, this is from, perhaps you remember in 1992, there was a uh, the first uh, conference on the environment uh, organized by the United Nations in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. I was there. And uh, in one of the uh, chapters uh, on sustainability or local sustainability, was called Agenda 21, appears something that later is, was uh, publicly known as the precautionary principle, that's principle 15. And we all knew at that time that we were talking about uncertainty. More precisely, the question was, how do you legitimize political decision-making and action in the presence of uncertainty? But if you read the text, which is a classic, the word uncertainty is not merge. What you see is the expression lack of full scientific certainty. So it, uncertainty is not mentioned. And well, I will leave it to you to reflect on two things. The first, why it's not mentioned. And the second is, is the lack of full scientific certainty the same as scientific uncertainty? Okay, uh, we can come back later in the conversation, but it's an interesting question. Now, so at that time, uncertainty could be solved and that that couldn't be solved was reduced again to a technical problem. Now, with time, things started to change. 
And here, I'm coming back to the EPA and this article from uh, Nature, 2008. And well, uh, you have a political practical problem, pollution, contamination, disease, whatever, okay? And so what you do, uh, you call a, a scientific panel, an expert panel. And what the article argues is that it, it, the quantitative evidence was characterized as having high uncertainties. So, and the interesting point uh, is this in, in red, is the beginning of an awareness that uh, what to do in the face of uncertainty is a policy question and not a scientific question. Okay, now, without entering in details, that's a big change. Here we have a public uh, and scientific discussion on the subject of uncertainty in, uh, in science advice or in the case of practical political problems. And uncertainty is discussed but to say, well, this is a, a policy question. What do you do? And it has to do, the article continues in an interesting way for those working risk and uncertainty. We'll see, you will immediately uh, recognize. The idea is how much a certain community, certain society can tolerate of uncertainty and risk as a basis for decision. The next I want to show is about the same time. At this time, uncertainty, again, this is from Scientific American, but uh, you have other sources. And this is by epidemiologist uh, David Michaels. And David Michaels talk about the fabrication of uncertainty. And the purpose of fabricating uncertainty is to fight regulation. So here it, it is all about how lobbies and eh, interests, in those cases, tobacco, the agribusiness, chemical, petrochemicals, and so on, eh, commission research in order to show uncertainty to fight regulation. I mean, more recently you're aware about the Conway and Oreskes book no? uh, on, uh, it's called the Merchants of Doubt, and it is in relation to the climate. And again, it's the idea that there are lobbies and so on that uh, commission research uh, in order to create uncertainty. And uh, the same way of, uh, you know, doubt is their product. You, you'll see fabrication. Fabrication, when you say fabricating uncertainty, is clearly has a, a negative connotation. So uh, by then, what I could see is that everybody has learned how to play the uncertainty game. And in this way, uh, uncertainty uh, becomes strategic. Now, uh, again, uh, I want to leave you a question for uh, reflection. On one hand, uh, uncertainty is very important for science. You know, uh, we, uh, it's what makes uh, science interesting, okay? Uncertainty and it opens a new areas of research. Let me call that good uncertainty. Whereas here, what we have is uncertainty that it's found eh, in order to use it strategically in a political institutional arena. Let me call it bad uncertainty, okay? Um, I'm using it ironically, I hope you understand. But the question is, how you recognize what is good uncertainty from 
bad uncertainty. Okay, so having done that, showing you what was happening in, during the 70s with the idea of Weinberg and so on, on trans science, eh? on trans science, and also uh, the origins of popular epidemiology, but in more general, uh, science, uh, uh, communities uh, de developing their own uh, knowledge base in order to defend themselves in situation of conflict, pollution, and so on, disease, and all the rest. And also seeing this transition from uncertainty being hidden, a monster, okay, a monster uh, in the sense of Lakatos, no, to uncertainty being played publicly uh, in a strategic form. Well, at that time, we developed and we thought in relation to this problematic eh, in a situation of complex practical political issues, questions eh, that required the production of knowledge, which was considered eh, important but a privileged source of input for decision-making. We found that there were a number of problems, which I mentioned uh, before, these complex problems have certain similar features or characteristics. And this is what we call the mantra of uh, post-normal science. The idea is, that facts are uncertain, values are in dispute, stakes high, and decisions urge. But you could immediately uh, uh, identify all these four uh, statements in the case of COVID. But uh, we can leave it at that, take a, a simple, reading of these statements, but we can, with more time, go even deeper and say, facts uncertain. How can a fact be uncertain? And our work has been to try to unpack this idea of facts about evidence, and of course, this idea of evidence-based policy. What is evidence? What is a fact? It's Again, complex, I'm overusing the word. Then this idea that uh, uh, values are important and they are plural and most of the time they are in conflict, that what it is at stake is very high. In case of COVID, I don't want to mention, but uh, you can have your own experience on this subject and that you have to do, make decisions in a situation of crisis of emergency. Okay. Now, it, all these cases, and people would say, well, values, stakes, decisions are just, uh, uh, they are not a part of modern science. Therefore, if we have problems that have these features, then of course, we have to go beyond modern disciplinary science. And uh, here, very, uh, this is the iconic, uh, the iconic diagram, and it was done just by, uh, to show how, in terms of uncertainty and what is at stake, uh, and it's important to show that these are not independent variables or dimensions. And it, it, as I mentioned before, and what is shown in the case of using uncertainty strategically, that we can, I mean, a bit uh, we ironically say that it's a system is, doesn't have uncertainties because it's not important. As soon as the stakes start to go up for someone, then uncertainty will emerge. Okay, and uh, that relates to the idea that in those conditions, 
we should put into brackets uh, uh, the idea of truth and concentrate on idea of equality, which is a fitness for purpose or function. And what we show in this diagram, as soon as you go up, going from the center up to the regions, is that which going up the community of those who evaluate quality grows and is extended. And, and the second is interesting, Chuck, to mention the professional consultancy that we call engineers, architects, medical doctors, veterinaries are not scientists as such. They apply science. But of course, the evaluation of quality of their productions is no longer a small group of people that study the same things and, uh, and publish in the same journals. Now, uh, given the time, we can go back, come back to this, but that was a short introduction to this, the idea. And before I try to tell you why. Now, it's clear that what I was saying is not valid only for COVID. COVID is a, a nice resource, but if you think about the climate change, if you think about ecosystems collapse, if you think about biodiversity loss, and in general about sustainability transitions, we are in the same area of knowledge creation. The terms that we mention as the mantra apply also here, and each of you have your favorite uh, example of a, a post-normal situation. Now, what's important also is the context in which all these problems, practical political problems exist. And they exist in a context where there are intolerable inequalities of different types, don't want to enter, that you find themselves in a situation of a weak democratic institutions, increasing authoritarian tendencies. And last but not least, a magical idea about what is the role of science in society. So you saw how all these elements, ill situation like COVID, climate, the uh, uh, ecosystem collapse, sustainability transitions, they play themselves in, in this situation, in this context. Now, uh, We, I think, after COVID, we should have learned that science doesn't speak with one voice. But we are still, we have still not learned that knowledge doesn't speak only the language of science. That important problems in and challenges in humanity's histories were solved not by science, but by other forms of knowledge. I don't have time, but we can come back to this. Practical knowledge, call him local knowledge, other type of knowledge that are, is not disciplined into what we call scientific knowledge. And uh, I wanted to finish, I'm um, almost over 40 minutes. What I said is what we have to do is to go from what it was called the orchestration of scientific disciplines and uh, uh, that's interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary to 
what I call a choreography of knowledges, which is in more transdisciplinary as trans implies is beyond scientific disciplines. Now, I used orchestration. I borrowed that from uh, the, the Vienna circle, uh, you know, Otto Neurath. Otto Neurath in the 30s uh, in the Vienna circle uh, uh, argued that uh, uh, in order to uh, face uh, the big uh, political challenges of the time, we are talking about the 30s, uh, we should have a kind of orchestration of scientific disciplines. My argument, if you take a Neurath argument today, we have to say that in the context I mentioned and in relation to the important challenges facing humanity, we have to go beyond and talk about how to harmonize and create this harmonic choreography of knowledge. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Funtowit. Um, I'd like to open the floor to any questions or points of discussion. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Well, you can unmute yourself if that's yeah. the case. I have a question. Okay. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Kathleen Garnett. I'm from Wageningen University. I'm doing a PhD on the role of innovation in environmental law, actually, and how that impacts the proportionary principle and the scientific uncertainty. So I'm really interested in seeing how the precautionary principle can be applied in a more rational way. At the moment, it's, it's being pretty much sidelined, I would say, in environmental law, precisely because a lot of, um, well, industry voices, I would say, are saying that it's very, you know, that there is scientific certainty, so there's no role for the precautionary principle anymore because they often cite um, their own toxicological reports and their risk assessments and try and say, this is certain, therefore we can approve this particular product and there's no more room for the precautionary principle. Um, and that's why I was interested in you were quoting Ruckelhaus actually, who was really, was he the head of the EPA at one stage even, I think in the seventies, if I'm correct. Um, and he was talking about trans science being the sort of point at which you can describe something mathematically, but you can't find certainty mathematically. And I've looked at quite a few environmental law cases from the 70s, which I find really, really interesting, um, where the judges recognize this and they talk about frontier science. They say the condition of scientific uncertainty arises when you're working on frontier science. And that really basically means anything that's absolutely novel or new. And the judges said, when you have this condition of novelty, you cannot quantify um, the certainty. You can't quantify causal relationships because you simply don't have the data. You can't do an epidemiological study on it because it's too new, we don't know. Now, what I'm really interested in is how patents create a lot of novelty because it's one of the conditions of a patent criteria is that, that it is absolutely new. So I'm trying to link uncertainty to novelty and the patent criteria. So my question for you is, are you aware of any kind of scientific studies that has looked at the condition of novelty giving rise to scientific uncertainty? Uh, okay, it's a, a, I mean, it's a, I, I, I'm trying to give way to other people also. So uh, 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 Kathleen, we can uh, continue our conversation later, but in principle, uh, uh, there was always, uh, and as I say, I, the precautionary principle that I mentioned in 92 in Rio uh, has a history too. Mm -hmm. And it comes from German uh, law before, and it has to do with ideas about uh, responsibility, you know, Hans Jonas and 
uh, that type of uh, literature. But substantially, uh, the idea is that uh, it's a distinction between what we can call a normative uh, principle and uh, someone and something that has been devolved again to science. And, and that was in 92, what it was done with proportionality and the idea because in order to trigger a precautionary principle in the idea of 92, it has to be proportional. And the idea of proportionality is a kind of what I call the politically correct cost-benefit analysis. Mm. And if you look at the formulation that is done, I think in the year 2000 by the communication of the European Commission on, on the precautionary principle, they go beyond, but still, it is, I believe it's not enough. There are other formulations uh, that have uh, uh, to do with the question about precaution. Now, from the beginning, uh, it was, um, in, well, it was well received in the European context, although, application is a different story, but it was well received. But outside Europe, it, it, it was uh, it, it, it was not favored. And I, I remember Americans uh, telling me, what is it this for Europeans? A kind of religion, they say to us. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look at the publication from the European Environmental Agency, uh, Late Lessons of Early Warnings, uh, which I'm sure you, you have looked. Uh, uh, there are discussions that relate to, uh, to your question. But what more interesting enough is that from the beginning, uh, uh, people argue that a precautionary principle has to be uh, balanced by an innovation principle. Mm. The idea that if you apply the precautionary principle strictly, you won't have an innovation. I think that's nonsense, but it, it, it will take long. And, and therefore, and in the last years, what we have seen, as you say, is that it lost a bit of interest, the idea of precautionary principle, because of course, it's all this, uh, we are running for innovation because the idea is that innovation will save the day. And it has to do with my last point about context and the idea that people have a magical idea about the role of science and technology in society. I'm sorry if I want to give other people there and you know how to find me. I, I know you from, from Twitter. Yes, so yes. Uh, we can continue our conversation because they are interesting material. And there are other formulations of the precautionary principle. Just to finish, if you want to create, if you want to introduce a normative principle in order to legitimize a, a political decisions in the face of uncertainty, you have to start questioning the strong relation between scientific certainty and correct uh, policy decisions yeah. or sound decisions. Thank you very much for your answer. And I'll give the floor to other people. I was just that you, you were also mentioning about uh, merchants of doubt and how on the one hand, um, industry is very happy to sow doubt on the scientific questions of tobacco or climate change. But when it comes to the precautionary principle, the very same industry are seeking absolute certainty or claiming certainty where there isn't certainty. And I think they've been playing this double game very, very well. Um, so I was just interested to, to hear what you thought, but thank you very much. Uh, I believe we have time for a couple more questions, if that's okay. Uh, so who would like to go next? Oh, Min, if you'd like to go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Sylvia. Do you hear Hi, me? Hi, Min. Hi, how are you? Thank you so much for the amazing presentation. So I'll try, I try to make it quick. So the burning question I have right now after listening is, do you have any um, recent or ongoing reflections and work related to the relations between the actual verb knowing? So I think there is also a difference between knowledge and the knowing itself. And uh, and the and values and what is 
ethics, what is values, what is culture. So I, I feel I feel that now the discussion on knowledge should go beyond just the knowledge itself and how we can connect that to the values and ethical questions. So I'm working, as you know, working on the quantification and and related um, ethics of knowing. So I would love to hear your views on that. If we have time, I do want to hear if you can, uh, if you have a um, sorry view on the question you raised: scientific uncertainties and lack of scientific certainty. Are they same? I'm really curious. What is your view currently? And lastly, like you have mentioned also about the bad and good uncertainties, and I wonder if the complexities of that um, the rising stakes and the whole complexity is going even more complex, right? related to topics we discussed. Do you think that that also raises um, further uncertainties related to that complexity that we, I mean, some another layer of complexity. Don't know if you have time for this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Min Young. I think we have uh, to continue uh, this discussion elsewhere, but uh, sure. uh, I mentioned at the end uh, uh, this idea that uh, uh, knowledge goes beyond uh, uh, beyond scientific knowledge. Scientific uh, uh, knowledge is an important part, and I mean it served us well uh, during history. But uh, as I say, it was uh, developed at the moment where uh, you know, with the beginning of the modern state and a new form of legitimation of political uh, action. And this idea that relates to a very strong relation between uh, the true and the good. And uh, so you discovered the truth, you expressed them quantitatively, you were able to predict, therefore you were able to control, and thereby, therefore you were able to manage, uh, and that was done by, for the common good. I mean, it, it was good and it worked. Uh, it had some bad moments uh, because it enabled uh, colonialism and also the fact that some small uh, European countries uh, became uh, world powers, uh, you know. But uh, that's part of the story and it has to do precisely with uh, technology, navigation and, and commerce and all uh, uh, the rest. But uh, uh, that was uh, predicated on the basis of uh, simplicity, as I say again. Uh, now, uh, it will take me a long time uh, to try to enter into that, but substantially, uh, and this is why I, I, I gave the, started with a case, which is the case of COVID, because we were all part of the story. And uh, if you look at it, uh, uh, one of the uh, advice we were given is to well, wash your hands uh, often, you know, wash your hands often. Well, uh, the idea of washing your hands is, didn't come from science, actually. Uh, it came from a, a, a medical a doctor in uh, that during the 80s, you know, and Samelweis, he was called, and he realized that uh, doctors and nurses uh, were, you know, dissecting uh, bodies in the morgue and then going to treat uh, women that were expecting babies. And uh, of course, many of these women uh, uh, die and got ill and all the rest. Because you say we should wash our hands. Uh, from when we go from one to the other. And, and the medical profession uh, laughed at him because, uh, uh, because it was uh, not consistent with the uh, scientific knowledge of medicine at the time. And I can give you many other examples. So what I'm arguing is that uh, we have to be more humble uh, and realize that uh, sciences and technologies are very powerful, but uh, there are problems that uh, go beyond their scope and areas of uh, legitimacy. And well, I will leave it like that. Uh, Sylvia, do you have time for one more question? Uh, I believe Enrique had one. 
Hi, yeah. Um, thanks, Sylvia, for the talk. Perhaps it's a um, silly question, but um, before modern times, knowledge had a um, strong theological nature, it was mainly in the sacred books. Um, Alfred Crosby um, explains this in his book, The Measure of Reality. Yeah. Um, so today, the number of non-believers um, increases. We'll start at the same time. Um, we hope science and technology will will solve um, all our problems, like, for example, climate change. Um, so my question is, um, is science the new God? Uh, well, uh, as you know, uh, there were uh, even uh, Thomas Kuhn, you know, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, argues, you know, that uh, it, it, that science might be a new religion, no? Uh, uh, of that, that, I I prefer not to not to enter into these analogies because uh, we have to be very clear what is our aim when we do these analogies. Okay, no, uh, so but. Uh, uh, what happens, uh, perhaps I didn't understand correctly your question, and I try to do it because we are, uh, I don't know, people perhaps have to go, but uh, this idea that, um, you know, true, uh, knowledge uh, was always uh, a part of action and let me call it decision, uh, but it had a, a very broad, definition about uh, knowledge, right? Uh, 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 in, uh, in Norwegian, we have this Wittenskap, no? Uh, in uh, German, we have Wissenschaft, no? Uh, all these words that talk about other forms of uh, knowledge, no? That go beyond the, uh, uh, Now, uh, you say that, more people have doubts, but at the same time, we're coming back to this more, uh, call it holistic view about uh, uh, knowledge, okay? Now, uh, what happened is, in my view, uh, my perspective, is that all these other forms always existed and they kept existing. But in a sense, they were hidden and silenced by a very strong uh, belief, a, a very strong belief. What happens is that when that strong belief starts to be in trouble, I wouldn't say collapse, but it's in trouble because we are living through a period of a crisis and emergency, and we have to respond with the knowledge we have know the knowledge we want or the one we need or the one we desire, okay? All these forms uh, have more room to appear. And uh, uh, not only that, uh, there is an enabling technology. In this case is the internet, but before it was a printing press. There is a situation where many people are angry. And there is, we are witnessing corruption. So this is a, a triad that enables change. It happened precisely with the origins of modernity, I mean, uh, and it might be happening today too. And if you look at the context I mentioned, it, that includes, as I say, weak uh, democratic institutions and all that type of context that enables a, un, a, a fragmentation of uh, the, the body politic. Now, uh, but there is the possibility of, uh, for optimism in a situation of uh, emergency, a crisis, no? Uh, and the optimism comes from precisely uh, the uh, number of experiments 
uh, that uh, are being done and increasing awareness about the need uh, to be, as I say, act with humility and not with hubris. And I recognize that if we are experiment, we are going to make mistakes and we are going to fail, we are going to err, which is very different from, you know, uh, the old idea about control and prediction. And uh, therefore, for me, it, the problem is not to make mistakes or to fail or to err. Uh, for me, uh, the issue, it has have to experiment how to make mistakes conserving at the same time a credibility and legitimacy. And, and well, the question becomes, how do you do that? And we haven't done it. And take, for example, and if you look at IPBS, no? which is the IPCC of biodiversity, no? if you look at it, they are trying to go precisely in that direction of choreography of knowledge is another. And, and this is something we'll have to learn. I'm sorry, I cannot give you the answer. It's not 42. Eh? That was Douglas Adams only. Yeah, the, the, the answer of the universe, right? 42. Thanks, Silvio. Thank you so much, Sylvia, for your talk. Um, we're really grateful to, for being with us today. And thank you to everyone who's attended. We will be uploading the recording later on in the day, hopefully, if everything goes well. And everyone have a good day. Take care. Thank you. Thanks.